people in the universe appeared around four billion years ago. humans only 200,000 years ago. Yet we have succeeded in disrupting the balance that is so essential to life. In 50 years, in a single lifetime, the Earth has been more radically changed than by all previous generations of humanity. We know that the solutions are there today. We all have the power to change. So what are we waiting for? Yes, ladies and gentlemen, I think this uh, trailer gives a nice impression uh, of what we have to protect, and it also gives a nice impression of the footprint that humanity already has on the planet. In fact, today we utilize more than a third of the planet's net primary production. The net primary production is the total amount of biomass that is produced by green plants uh, on our planet. Uh, we have exhausted uh, or overused one quarter of global fisheries and are using to the limit another half of the global fisheries. All of this has led to a new wave of extinction of species that may reach the same order of magnitude as the wave that led to the extinction of the dinosaurs at the end of Cretaceous. And another important issue is climate change. In fact, today we're increasing global CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere at the rate larger than any time in human history. This rapid rate is in part a result of a recent change in the carbon intensity of our uh, economy to become more carbon intensive. In fact, we are moving away from a clean economy towards a brown economy. Climate change today already contributes uh, to a reduction of wheat yields, as was reported in Nature uh, last week, to a change in the migration patterns of birds and other uh, impacts on nature. I think it should be clear that we cannot go on using as many resources as we do do today and causing as much pollution uh, as we cause today. What we really need to think about is uh, fundamental ways in which we can redesign our economy to, uh, to not overuse resources and to respect the levels of pollution that the planet uh, can tolerate. We will fundamentally need to think about new modes of welfare uh, that will be required to achieve the changes uh, that we need to undertake. Now, in this presentation, I would like to talk about the contribution that we can make through research in from going from understanding what the environmental problems are through understanding how these environmental problems are caused to finding solutions and developing new ways of designing infrastructure, new technologies 
of providing nutrition, providing comfort, uh, and new ways of organizing our life, because that is what is really required. Now, uh, this uh, nice figure shows the planetary boundaries. Uh, this chart indicates actually a range of environmental and resource issues, which are important to consider. Climate change is one of them, the acidification of the ocean, stratospheric ozone depletion, nitrogen and phosphorus cycles, the over-fertilization of our environment, and uh, biodiversity loss. You can see here that in the area of biodiversity and the nitrogen cycle and climate change, we are already living beyond our means. Whereas in some other ways, in some other areas, we are about to approach our means. So what we need uh, to develop is a way that we can develop our economy uh, without violating these planetary boundaries. And this we can do only if we have measures and indicators that tell us how are we doing compared to, uh, to, this to the planetary boundaries. How are we doing on these different indicators? How are we doing with respect to climate change, with respect to the nitrogen cycle, with respect to the extinction of species? And so I think it is necessary to consider this both uh, at the level of the human enterprise as a whole, as was done in this paper, uh, and also at the level of uh, the individual, at the level of the individual enterprise, of a city, uh, of uh, a living quarter. How are we doing? How can we measure this? And how do alternative ways of developing uh, our technologies, of developing our infrastructures, of changing our lifestyles actually impact uh, our performance with respect to these indicators. Now, the traditional view of looking at our economy is one of the balance of supply and demand. It is matching supply and demand in the, our understanding of the economy, producers produce goods and products uh, that they sell to households. Households supply labor and capital to producers for which they get paid. This closes the monetary circle. What is absent from this picture is in fact the elephants and the whales that we have seen in the trailer. It is the resources and the pollution what is really happening is that this economic system happens embedded in the larger ecological system. And it is from this larger ecological system that we take the resources that we make our products out of, and that we take the energy that we need to shape these products into the products that we want to have. In the process of transforming the materials uh, and of utilizing the energy, we produce wastes these end up in the environment. And we need to understand how much of waste uh, this environment can actually tolerate. This is the understanding uh, that we have as industrial ecologists. In fact, industrial ecology is a discipline uh, that focuses on uh, the understanding of the resources that we use. Where do the resources go once we have taken them out of the ground or harvested them from nature? What are the amounts of energy that we need for these transformation processes of uh, materials uh, to goods and products? Um, and how much pollution, how much resource use is the household responsible for through its consumption uh, in the whole supply chain and in the waste treatment? Uh, we call our ob object of study also society's metabolism. Uh, and so I would now like to give you some examples of research in industrial ecology that has been performed by staff at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology that I think is quite relevant to the problem of a green economy. 
In fact, uh, I have a hard time seeing how we can get to a green economy without considering these research results. And the first example that I would like to provide you with is the carbon footprint of nations. In this work, we have tried to look at the global greenhouse gas emissions and see what consumption activities cause these greenhouse gas emissions. Because ultimately, the purpose of industrial activity is to satisfy uh, some consumption. And what you can see from the figure here on the right-hand side is that household consumption is responsible for about 72% of the global greenhouse gas emissions. And here it is especially uh, shelter, food, and transportation that stand out as important consumption categories. However, there are some other categories that we also cannot, forgets, uh, cannot forget, like investment uh, and manufactured products, consumer products. What we also saw from in our research, that as wealth increases in society, the carbon footprint per capita increases just as much. There is a straight relationship between the levels of consumption and the carbon footprint. In our way of looking at the global network of production and consumption, we trace the emissions from where they are caused through these life cycles of products to where the products are consumed. This also means that we can take into account the emissions that are embodied in the traded products. Today, about a quarter of the global emissions are caused in the production of internationally traded products. And if you take this international trade into account, you see that over the last 10 years, the carbon footprint of Norway has increased by 20 million tons, or about 25%, compared to what it was 10 years earlier. While in the national emission statistics, it looks like Norway is doing fine, it is keeping its emissions stable. I think it is this type of knowledge that is really required to design uh, the policies for a green economy. And it is also important to consider these international trade effects when we develop indicators for measuring our success. The second example that I would like to show you uh, is research conducted by my colleague Daniel Müller, and it is on the use of iron and steel. He has done studies for a number of OECD countries and found out uh, that in general, in the industrialized countries, we need about 10 tons of iron and steel per capita. These 10 tons can be found in our infrastructure, in the buildings, in the bridges, and in the products that we have, especially in cars in this case. And there, if the global a population is also expected to reach 10 tons per capita. There is a lot of steel production that is still required to satisfy uh, this level. In fact, the energy technologies that we have heard of, they all require more iron and steel uh, than uh, the conventional fossil energy sources. What you see on the figure is actually an example from the United States. Uh, in this figure, the green area indicates the steel that is in use, that is in the infrastructure or in the product somewhere. And the interesting thing is that this green area is now larger than the known remaining reserve of iron and steel in the US. There's more iron and steel in, already in use than there is available known in the ground. So, most likely, the cities will become our mine of the future. And it is important to know where the iron and steel it is, is, and it is important to know what qualities it have, has in order to redesign our material cycles, to actually start in our present day use. And we need to fundamentally think about 
uh, how we can actually make use of this material in the future. Is it through reuse? Is it through recycling? What are the energy requirements and the pollution associated with the different alternatives? Industrial ecology traditionally has focused on empirical research of understanding uh, the stocks and flows of materials, the environmental impacts that are connected to, to different products or to different energy technologies. I think in the future, we really need to understand how our choices uh, regarding the technologies that we employ, regarding the infrastructures that we build, and regarding the consumption patterns that we adapt, affect uh, the physical economy, the levels of the flows from and to nature, uh, our pressures on the environment. We need to be able to actually simulate different alternatives and their impact on the environment. And there I think it is important to see that there are different scales that we need to take into account. We have a global scale. It is on the global scale that we see the impacts are em that are emerging. If you look at a simple electronic gadget, it is produced in at least 30 countries around the world, the different parts that are in, an, in this gadget. Um, and so we need to understand these impacts. But at the same time, we need to understand the effect of the local choices on this global supply chain and on the different uh, environmental impacts and resource requirements uh, that it triggers. And we also need to go the other way. We need to be able to follow uh, the effect of global trends, global resource availability uh, and its impacts on the local decisions that we make and, and the lives that we live. So, uh, I think we need to fundamentally look at the different functions that we have in our life. Nutrition, uh, housing, uh, mobility, uh, entertainment, and how they are fulfilled. And I think this is really uh, interesting work for us to do in the future. I think that uh, here uh, in Trondheim, we are actually very well positioned. We have built up databases uh, of global material cycles. We have uh, acquired the capability to construct global uh, multi-regional input-output models. Those are the models that calculate the global carbon footprints. Uh, in fact, uh, we are leading uh, research in this area on the European level right now. We have the chance uh, to collaborate with our social scientists, colleagues, to understand how changes in lifestyles and consumption patterns affect these impacts on the environment. And we have uh, the chance to understand what kind of changes are actually acceptable and feasible. So I think that designing the green economy uh, is the ultimate challenge uh, for industrial ecology. Thank you.